Hello subscribers. I would like to introduce you to a writer called Victor Hampton who works for a, or I'm not sure exactly what the relationship is to uh, Rise Up magazine. Now he's written um, an article that I thought was tremendous. It's absolutely phenomenal. It's one of the best things that I have ever seen a first worldist write. Like it's genuinely very positive and I'm pretty much always down on first world Marxists. But this guy's work is incredibly good. It's about building dual power structures in society. Like, for example, uh, one of the things that's said about Maoism is that it's not applicable to the first world because it's supposedly all about peasant movements, which is not true. Maoism is about understanding different conditions that exist outside of the traditional Marxist-Leninist line. For example, what uh, he, and I believe the organization that he's uh, associated with, uh, has laid out how to build dual power structures in the cities, uh, specifically referring to Canada because it is a very um, urban-centered uh, population, and how to build competing uh, power structures alongside the bourgeois ones. And the work is actually very, very good. So what I am going to do is make a video here basically outlining what's in it, but I, I want you to go to the, to the link in description and read the original work for yourself. It is very, very good. Possibly more than any other branch of the government, the city, the municipal level, is the one that you and I interact with most in our day-to-day -day lives. In fact, it's the one that is probably the most useful in uh, enforcing the bourgeois system. Most of our daily interactions with the state actually occur with the city itself, as opposed to the provincial or the federal government. And in fact, a lot of what it is that's used by the bourgeois state and their order uh, is done through there. Like, uh, urban planning, construction, stuff like that, is all done through the state. And the, by that, I mean the, the city, as opposed to the provincial or federal government, meaning it's the one that we actually interact with the most and actually does have the most effect on our lives because this is the one that literally organizes and operates the city in which we live. It also sends up things like uh, the regulation of bourgeois land rights, um, poverty programs, our interaction with the police are usually with city police itself. And they also set up the organs, uh, the consultative organs within the city that we, you know, theoretically we have a channel by which we can talk directly with those in power that doesn't really do anything. But the point is, it's the city that sets that up. So we do see that much of our interaction is actually on the city level, not with, say, the, uh, the provincial or federal government. We would be ignorant if we didn't recognize the success that the city level has had in enforcing bourgeois rule. In fact, it has been very effective in that regard. But we must also keep in mind that there are cracks and crevices, uh, contradictions within the city itself. It is this we must recognize along with the importance and the power of the city. Very often people have the idea that the city can be reformed. In fact, it's the one that we most believe we can do something with through the bourgeois democratic channels. I mean, the city is the one in which, particularly most middle-sized cities, you don't have to be super rich to get into office. In fact, sometimes the odd semi-working class person can actually get into office. Now, it's through this we have the illusion that we really can do something. The municipal level gives us the illusion that we can push through some kind of change. But we all know what kind of change the bourgeois will really let us do. And we must keep that in mind because it does present us with a big illusion of democracy when it really doesn't exist at all. One of the functions of the state is to make us believe that the working class and the bourgeois can live side by side in peace and that the contradiction between the two doesn't exist. For one good example of this, we should look no further than Toronto city planning in which they had decided to disperse poverty throughout the city, which means instead of having a high concentration through the use of the market, the regular gentrification that we do find, they decided to plan specific low income housing around the city to try to disperse the poverty thus making it look like that the bourgeois and the working class can live side by side in peace. I mean, this is only a plan, a plan that is not going to work and doesn't actually tackle any of the contradictions in capitalism itself, but it is symptomatic of something that is a symbol that we can believe that the city or the, or the democratic institution, the bourgeois democratic institution, can put forward through some kind of change, which is why in a lot of city 
city level stuff or particularly Toronto g given its size that there's a lot of uh, labor organizations unions community activists always put such a high emphasis on organizing within the city because they too have been co-opted by the bourgeois mentality the bourgeois idea that democratic reforms through the bourgeois system actually help I mean, we've seen historically that they do not tackle the problems whatsoever and are at best merely a band-aid. What we have to do is recognize the city's potential, the bourgeois the city structure, as something that is very, very good in co-opting these movements that could be very revolutionary, that could be uh, potentially groundbreaking and presenting alternatives to the formal city structure. Here in the first world and others, uh, particularly I'm going to say Canada because this is primarily about uh, written about Canada, the city pro provides us with what we uh, what we think to be an opportunity for social democracy, where we can the social welfare programs where we can have the state organize uh, money for particular programs that help the poor, working class people, whatever. And that has been one of the things that has made it so attractive and has de-revolutionized or de-radicalized people in the, the labor movement as well. This perception is falling. There is now no longer the money because of, for several reasons, to actually put these through anymore. That illusion is now starting to fall because it doesn't have the money to do all these programs that has pulled the working class away. Now, there's at least two main reasons for that. One, a marked shift in the economy away from manufacturing towards a service-based economy. Two, the slow but increasing decline in regulations on capital and protections for workers and society, as well as the distributive social and economic policies that have been set in place throughout the post-World War II period. One of the things that the post-World War II era did was strengthen the labor movement to a point where it created a kind of detente between the working class and the capitalist class. And this has given us the room to uh, demand all kinds of social programs. See, the problem with this is it's now falling apart because it doesn't have the money to keep these programs running anymore. So means all those benefits that unions and other uh, organized labor did, the, the, the struggles they went through to, to get the things we have today are now no longer available. When these things fall and the true face of capitalism can no longer hide behind its, its uh, human face, as it were, we're going to see an increased radicalization of labor how effective that will be and what it will really lead to remains to be seen the point is we should be there to jump on that when it happens the point is all those benefits that were fought by struggles over that you know post world war ii period are now finally coming down the question for us as marxists remains what do we do with this increased militancy how do we turn this into a popular struggle against the capitalist class? How do we use this to increase our own lives and make our situation better? What do we do with this popular anger once it begins? We have to be careful with what it is that we do with this, uh, uh, this unrest, this increased militancy of labor. We don't want to do anything that would decrease anything within the welfare state. Like we don't want to just push that advocate austerity measures to just go ahead and just destroy people's you know social conditions so that we get what we want faster more anger towards the the, the capitalist state because if we do that it's only going to justify to people that the belief that they need that bourgeois state we need to find a way to channel that anger towards what is essentially a capitalist class whether the people realize it or not and use that for something positive what we have to do is be prepared, be planned, know what to do, and don't just do you know, some kind of outrageous things that just end up driving people back into the hands of the bourgeoisie. What we need to do is build alternatives. One of the things we're stuck with right now is that uh, activists and unions are very married to the uh, Keynesian model of uh, government, meaning it's stuck with ideas of state funding and stimulus projects and government intervention as opposed to actually dealing with the real problems, the real contradictions of capitalism that create the problems that it is that we have. Well, that's a problem. These people who have the most amount of power, who are at least superficially placed in a position of challenging the system are very married to an idea that doesn't inherently challenge the system itself nor does it actually fight against the very thing that causes these problems 
Because manufacturing is gone, and frankly, it's not going to come back, unions and uh, many social organizing committees actually understand this, and they do realize that the majority of the tax money that we use to prop up the Keynesian model now no longer exists. Those uh, industrial jobs are not here, the manufacturing jobs, and you can't tax people that aren't doing the work, and this did replace with minimum wage, part-time jobs, mall economy, that sort of thing. So what the system is doing instead is looking for a replacement. Uh, high-tech jobs, academia, intelligentsia, uh, really petty bourgeois for things that are niche market that uh, large corporations uh, don't feel that it's worth investing in. They then, like, like artists and stuff like that, and then the government and then taxes these people to try to fill the gap that was left by the uh, depletion of manufacturing. Unfortunately, this is not enough, and many of these unions and social groups uh, highly support that because it would bring at least some tax revenue. But again, this doesn't actually solve the problem of unemployment and a lack of manufacturing jobs. Many of these organizations and many of the people who stand by this lament the good old days, meaning back when industrial jobs were strong, back when we had a better sense of community or when we had traditional values. Now what this does is become nostalgic for something that does not exist and cannot exist again inside of capitalism given the way it functions. What this does do is it drags away from rightful criticisms that should be made of the system. It becomes times have changed or things are just not like they used to be as opposed to understanding that these are problems of the system itself. Not something external that has happened to the system but written into the very fabric of the system itself. Now what this uh, sense of nostalgia tends to do is externalize what has happened and thus it doesn't criticize the system itself. All of this in the end means that the loss of manufacturing jobs and the economic crisis cannot keep up enough state funds to prop up the illusion of social democracy meaning it can't keep holding up this idea of capitalism with a human face and finally the people have to see the real face of it whether they like it or not unfortunately in times like these those in the lower and middle classes don't understand class struggle they don't understand the class nature of what is happening because they've been indoctrinated with bourgeois mentality meaning they don't see the reasons why this is happening and with a lack of an understanding there the masses tend to turn toward very reactionary things like uh far-right extremism, they turn towards uh, European-style anti-immigration, they turn towards racism and xenophobia because they are conditioned to believe that the system itself doesn't have anything wrong with it. There are no inherent problems in the system that would always cause it to tend towards crisis. It must be something coming from without. And given the nationalist nature of capitalism, the nationalism that it uh, perpetuates, people will look for things that are outside of that idea and that usually ends up being brown people or people who just have a different religion than them this failure to understand the class nature of the system itself and the antagonisms behind those class relations forces them to look other places and find things that don't cause it to end up to end up in the hands of right-wing reactionary forces and with the lack of a real left alternative Many of the leftists that are around, but I mean, I don't mean like, like us, Marxists, anarchists, what have you, like NDPers, they also don't really understand the class nature of all this. So what they end up doing instead is arguing for us to go back to those times, like back to like the good old days, because they, because they want that, but they don't like the reactionary right wing kind of mentality so what they do is they argue for the state just to bring back the social democratic uh, policies that were there uh, like social programs health care and all that rather than actually challenge the system itself and acknowledge that the system causes these problems themselves so because there's no real left they end up reverting right back to where it was they were before and just demanding the same thing that they were demanding under capitalism when it was in better times, which means in the end, it inherently challenges nothing about the system itself. What people need to understand is that it's not that these you know, social programs would cease to exist in socialism. They absolutely would continue. But the class and nature of the state that provides these programs 
would be completely different. And that would be very different from a bourgeois state, which is predicated on and does carry out the will of the bourgeois as opposed to the people. And this is also to go along with the fact that bourgeois liberal democracy is not the same thing as a people's democracy. These are two qualitatively different things. As capitalism continues to crumble, and the state apparatus of the bourgeois has to be more and more repressive towards the people. People will begin to understand their relation to the state. They will begin to understand their class position within society. Eventually, that will manifest itself in outrage towards that system. Our goal as Marxists is to be there to organize that force. We have to wait for that shift in consciousness. We have to build alternatives for when the people finally make that realization. We must build institutions to take care of people in the meantime. That is the main goal here, is to be prepared for when the state has lost, when the bourgeois state has lost all of its legitimacy and nobody wants to have it around anymore. And we must be ready to provide an alternative for it. As capitalism continues to erode, as the global crisis of capitalism continues and gets worse, a lot of these services that are, will be available for people will cease to be there. And what we have to do is build a competing institution that will take over those functions when the state one fails. And it is when we do that that we educate them on the class position of all this. They realize their relationship to the bourgeois system and how it doesn't serve them, but only serves the bourgeois. We must be there to educate and organize people when that time comes. That's the whole point of building dual powers is to take care of the needs of the people and build up the strength necessary to challenge the system. It is in this that we can build the foundation for struggle. As capitalist institutions of, through the bourgeois state fail and can no longer provide for the people as they have previously demanded, we step in, we fill that place, and then we educate them so that they understand why it's necessary to struggle against a system that does not work and why they must struggle against a system that is repressive to them and essentially tries to destroy them. And to understand once and for all that this is not a democracy, it is a bourgeois democracy. It is a democracy only for the bourgeois, and even that, given the state of everything, is coming to an end. During this tentative period of building a dual structure, we must look to the past to see what advice we can learn from past victories. For example, here we will quote Lenin. The highly remarkable feature of our revolution is that it has brought about a dual power. This fact must be grasped first and foremost, unless it is understood, we cannot advance. We must know how to supplement and amend old formulas. For example, those of Bolshevism, for while they have been found to be correct on the whole, their concrete realization has turned out to be different. Nobody previously thought or could have thought of a dual power. What is this dual power? Alongside the provisional government, the government of the bourgeoisie, another government has arisen, so far weak and insipid, but undoubtedly a government that actually exists and is growing, the Soviets of workers and soldiers deputies. What is the class composition of this other government? It consists of the proletariat and the peasants in soldiers uniforms. What is the political nature of this government? Is it a revolutionary dictatorship, i.e. a power directly based on revolutionary seizure of the direct initiative of the people from below and not on the law enacted by the centralized state power is an entirely different kind of power from one that generally exists in parliamentary bourgeois democratic republics of the usual type still prevailing in the advanced countries of Europe and America. This circumstance often overlooked, often not given enough thought, yet it is the crux of the matter. This power is of the same type of the Paris Commune of 1871. The fundamental characteristic of this type are 1. The source of power is not law previously discussed and enacted by Parliament, but the direct initiative of the people from below in their local areas, direct seizure to use a current expression. 2. The replacement of the police and the army, which are institutions divorced from the people and set up against the people by the direct arming of the whole people in order the state under such power is maintained by the armed workers and peasants themselves, by the armed people themselves. 3. 
officialdom, the bureaucracy, are either similarly replaced by the direct rule of the people themselves, or at least placed under special control. They are not they not only become elected officials, but are also subject to recall at the people's first demand. They are reduced to the position of simple agents from a privileged group holding jobs remunerated on a high bourgeois scale. They become workers of a special arm of the service whose remuneration does not exceed the ordinary pay of a competent worker. Reforms only reinforce the existing bourgeois system. This is why we choose revolution as opposed to reform. This is why we advocate completely changing everything as opposed to just propping up what's already there. The bourgeois and his state apparatus has a complete hold on the people, a deep connection to them with their ideas, culture, mentality, everything. The point of the dual structure is to provide an alternative to that so that people leave that mentality, stop believing the lies of the bourgeois state that is there to represent them, and then in a sense come over to us and believe us and fight with us against a system that's unjust. The dual power challenges the legitimacy of the bourgeois democratic system and it's shown to be a fraud and then people come over to our side. This not only breaks the grip of the bourgeois but it also trains and prepares people to build institutions to replace it, to come over to us, to a democratic people's system and then train our dual structures to eventually replace the old ones that existed in the bourgeois state. Eventually along the way in the course of development this will present a real challenge to the bourgeois state and means that these dual power structures, these people's institutions, will eventually end up taking hold of resources that the bourgeois state once had. And once this happens and power comes over to our side, the state will recognize this, become scared, understand that its grip is slipping, and resort to more and more brutal and fascist measures in order to try to hang on to its own survival. Now we have to ask ourselves an important question. What does building a dual power structure look like in an imperialist country like Canada? In Canada, there are 31 cities with more than 100,000 people. No less than 80% of the population, 25 million, lives in these urban centers. While various forms of building dual power are possible, an assessment of the conditions, including the location and size of the power of the state as it is, indicate that this necessitates primarily urban forms. This means we recognize that the main institutions that the people interact with are those of the city level, meaning we understand that the power structures themselves exist primarily on a city level. We must build an institution that tries to exist alongside that and pull people away from it. As we see City Hall in a particular country, we must mimic that structure in order to replace it, meaning as there is a City Hall in the city, there is now a people's city hall. And then as the legitimacy of the bourgeois state begins to fail, the people will turn towards the power structures that we have set up that challenge that system. There must be a people's alternative. And we can only do that by mimicking the state functions itself. We must be prepared to replace it and replace the actual functions it takes. For example, the city does do planning. The city does register land and control land ownership. When that eventually falls, our dual structure that exists alongside of it that will now take its place, the People's City Hall, must be prepared to do those same functions. And they must be ideologically in line with Marxism, Leninism, Maoism, meaning it has to recognize class struggle and actively seek to fight class struggle. But again, we return to Lenin, and he says that there are three basic characteristics that dual power structures must have. One. They must be created and run by the people. Two, they must replace the armed apparatus of the state. Three, they must make official done subject to popular will. This means building the alternatives to the official structure would require a high level of organization and political work, meaning it has to adhere very strongly to an MLM line. And it is only through, through this that we can achieve victory, because if we just build some kind of institution not based on any particular um, ideology, what ends up happening is just a, a repetition of what already exists. It must be built along a Marxist, Leninist, Maoist line if it is to inherently be revolutionary itself. What we need is a high level of organization and to build these power structures with an application of MLM. Only through this 
can we build the appropriate competing power structures? All this information that I have given in this video is a very superficial uh, summary of what's in the actual document. To fully understand everything that's being said by this group, is being, you know, being said by this guy, you have to go down and read the original document itself. In there you will learn far more than I've said here and your understanding of it will be much, much deeper. I highly recommend anybody who wants to understand stuff to, to go down there and read it right now. It's very, very good. And there's a bunch of other stuff too there. And uh, I wholeheartedly uh, recommend studying this because it's very, very important and it's very, very well done. Thank you for watching. Go ahead, rate, comment, subscribe, share on various social media. And if you want, there's some other great content here you could check out.